So, upper sixth, bullet point eight, the last bullet point for this year's research theme. And this is a massive research theme. There is no ways we can cover this all even before the exam, let alone in a video. So I will do my best to skim the surface of this research theme, give you a little bit of an overview of some of the things that we'll be talking about in class and we'll be exploring through exam style papers that we have um, bought in and some of them we have developed ourselves. So thank you in advance to Ian Marcuse again for his wonderful contribution and also to the team at Tutor to You because we bought their exam papers this year as we do every year. They're very good at writing exam papers. So let's crack on then. So before looking at this, I thought to myself, we've been talking about all these luxury brands and what are their purpose? Well, we we tend to think about strap lines and mission statements and you know strategies and all those sorts of things when we first start our A level in the lower sixth. And we should go back to them really. So Burberry, they their strap line is iconic British luxury. No mention of delivery company. Maybe there's a trend. ASOS to give fashion loving 20 somethings, clearly me. The confidence to be whoever they want to be. Gucci, you can read it. World class, want to be their leader. Just do it. Wouldn't be the same without a strap line um, slide, without a bit of just do it in there. Still don't know what that means. It's that absolute mass market thing that could mean anything. John Lewis, for all life's moments... Isn't it a shame they've walked away from uh, never knowingly undersold? Um, well, they didn't want a price match anymore, so I sort of understand that. And Marks and Spencers, not in bigger text for any other reasons than I just copied this off Google. Um, we never compromise on quality. Now, I can, I can link that into distribution. If you think about it, when I go into their shops, this is part of place, this is part of our distribution um, channel, I expect polite, well-trained staff, clean stores, safe, good lighting, good ticketing on the shelves. I'm expecting that whole extended marketing mix experience. If I walk in and speak to their people, remember people is not customers, um, it's the people that uh, are working for the company, in this case Marks and Spencers, if they're rude, unhelpful, not very knowledgeable, not coming back. I'm going to go somewhere else that trains their staff. Um, if I walk into the store and I can't find things, I'm, it's, my expectation is I should be able to find things or someone will be able to help me. And if you go into Marks and Spencers and you look lost for too long, someone will probably walk up to you with an iPad in their hands and ask you what you're looking for. They understand how important their logistics network is to them. So if I can't find a pair of Dalmatian trousers in my size, then someone will come over and order them for me and they will either get delivered to the store or they'll get delivered to my home. OK, so they are very good at integrating their distribution channels. But Marks and Spencers don't make trousers. They don't ship them from China or wherever they're getting made. Um, they're not interested in in growing cotton to then go through that whole process that we've talked about before. So what do Marks and Spencers want to do? Well, they want to sell me trousers, and then they want me to sell. They want to sell me trousers again and again and again for the rest of my life, and they want me to tell my family and friends and anyone that will listen how wonderful Marks and Spencers is because they want repeat business. So customer service throughout the whole supply chain, the value chain for me as a customer, I might be remotely interested in welfare of cotton farmers. I'm more interested in if my trousers don't fit, can I send them back hassle free? Maybe Marks and Spencers want to do this themselves. If they do enough of their own returns, it might be that they want to invest in that part of the business. It might be that they go with a specialist. So here's another strap line for you. Excellence simply delivered. This sounds a bit 
more like a delivery company to me. And then below that, when I copied it off their website earlier, actually, it's not just a tagline. We truly live it. And yes, this is the mighty DHL. Last time I checked, Marks and Spencers don't own aeroplanes or trains. OK, so they will outsource that to a specialist and quite rightly so as well, because the specialists are probably a lot better as a delivery company than Marks and Spencers could be. Marks and Spencers want to sell me trousers. They don't necessarily want to worry about international freight routes. So here's the spec as such. I should put my pen up, really. Um, here's the spec from your lower sixth. Um, and yes, it links into the majority of the rest of the A level. So I'm not, I initially thought I would cross reference this for you to help you revise this. And then I remembered that it would probably be the entire A level. So we've got to cover this as an absolute minimum. We've got the, we've got the wonderful social trends in there. And this is another trap for students. Students will just simply repeat social trends instead of talking to me about the social trend and how it influenced whatever's in the question you've got to make sure you describe the social trend that is in the case study so at the moment for example in the uk actually around the globe probably um, the social trend is lots of people are using social media and they're being influenced by social media influencers this has led to OK, um, and we will talk about that before we go on um, talking about the mighty DHL. There is a very useful website down here to do with retailing and fashion logistics. I've put the URL in there for you. I've happily plagiarized half of their website for this presentation, but there's a lot more stuff on there. There's loads of research documents. There's case studies on companies from the micro business. Um, like we saw with one of our um, ethical fashion retailers, maybe they're going to help them uh, because they're not delivery company either. They still need to get in their plain um, T-shirts before they print on them, for example. Um, it could be you're going to read about quick commerce, the last mile of the journey. You know, and some of the stuff that I've read this morning, I didn't even know happened, to be honest with you. But I'm not the target market. The retailers are. And they want to, as in DHL, want to help retailers and be that pure play only online, be that just bricks and mortars, Primark, um, be that multi-channel, omni-channel, omni-channel being all the channels, including selling via social media and stuff like that. So and some of the luxury stuff was just it just blew my mind. The last mile service, which we'll cover a little bit more. Um, mass personalization is something else in the industry um, and we're not going to cover it in um, this video we might do a case study on it in class actually reading that report this morning um, and people want their personalized t-shirts for example so it could be something like that as a bit of an overview and this is a very basic graphic that I found online if we're thinking about it, we've got people that might specialize in designing yeah and then manufacturing and buying the stuff before it gets made. And it could be multiple components, dies, threads, I don't know, the little metal rivets that go into denim jeans, for example. Levi are not a mining company. You know, they might want to get that from somewhere. Um, and then you've got centralised warehousing, which could go off to your B2B, straight into warehouses, um, to do with big wholesalers that then sell them on or some of these big retailers are the size of wholesalers so they will buy a big discount okay give me a thousand size 10 of that um, and they'll stick it in a warehouse and then they'll stick it onto smaller pallets and send it out to their stores or other distribution centers it could be directly to consumers and this is why companies like DHL and there are others um, they will manage the lot they'll store your stuff for you they they will have full integration into your websites they might even help you sort the website out 
And then when I order something from Gucci, it arrives in a Gucci bag. It's pristine. It's beautiful. I open up my beautiful Gucci handbag and I'm proud. Might have come from a DHL web, um, warehouse and it was put in a bag by a DHL worker. I don't know. I didn't know that. And generally, as long as it's in good condition and it gets here on time, great. That allows companies like Gucci to focus on building rapport with customers, coming up with next year's fashions, marketing, marketing, marketing. You know, they've got to constantly market to remind people to buy these products. Do they really want to be focused on a global distribution network? Probably not, unless it supports the brand, unless it differentiates the brand. Companies like DHL can help suppliers identify recycled packaging. They can find ethical, they, they will help every, with everything with that. That's what they do really well. Okay, so if you're a small company and you want to achieve all those ethical, environmental, sustainability goals, these companies can actually help you do it instead of you doing it yourself for a fee, obviously. So, some potential exam questions to introduce what we're going to go through. Okay, I won't read the questions out to you, just the headings. So we're going to talk about the different channels. Yeah, the B2B, the B2C, and the C2C. We're seeing a lot of C2C stuff out there with Depop and stuff like that. So there's a couple of questions there that you can possibly think about planning and answering in context with what we're going to talk about. We've then got our changes to do with social trends. And yes, we're going to talk about social media influencers. Um, the pop-up adverts that I'm getting when I go onto Google at the moment are hilarious because of doing some of this research theme for you. Um, clearly, um, I'm getting some different adverts at the moment, but uh, maybe I'll clean those, clear those cookies down quite quickly. And then we're going to go on to obviously expanding it into the ones that we just mentioned as well. OK, so the distribution methods, the different channels, um, yeah, wholesale, B2C. We're going to do lots of lots of stuff to do with that. So, oh, there's Molly May. I didn't even know who Molly May was until my teenage daughter um, obviously was talking to me about Love Island, which I never watched, by the way, as a Dalmatian. Um, so um, very interesting how she's now got her own range of clothing on Pretty Little Things. Does she design clothes? Does she make clothes? Does she source them from the Far East? No, she doesn't. Someone just pays her a bucket load of money to stick her name on them. Um, and maybe she meets with the designers. I don't know. I would like to think so. Um, other than that, um, she, good for her. She's going to get paid a lot of money for it. So more exam style questions. Um, and so we've got social media derived stuff, which is which is clearly the, the previous slide as well. Um, and clothing rental, second hand platforms. Uh, this is a relatively old concept that seems to come up again and again. John Lewis will rent you your ski wear for the season, for example. Um, these guys will do the same thing down here and there are others out there as well. So I've got a screenshot from my wardrobe and they will loan you a handbag. You can pay a subscription and get different handbags that come through, um, which is which is very interesting, um, sort of. And then we've got Vinted, Depop. Um, lots of you at school will be selling off your old clothes. And there are some companies that are just... They used Vinted because Vinted has got the mass market appeal of advertising and getting people in and they're very good with social media. So if I'm a small business wanting to start up, then maybe I go through a third party. Same sort of thing as what Amazon have been doing for years. I pay Amazon possibly 15 percent commission for the privilege of selling through their platform. They've got tens of millions of customers that I can only dream of getting. So you sacrifice some of your potential profits because another company is advertising and attracting customers for you. Vinted, Depop, lots of other ones out there, um, and you know, including eBay in some ways. eBay seems to have fallen out of fashion, thankfully. Probably all the charges. Um, so, And then we've got a couple of slides on some stuff to do with 
DHL. And I think, I don't know, I'm guessing exam questions again here. If we were talking about global supply chains and everything else, we could just go down the talking about the company, which is what we've seen in previous research themes. Maybe they're going to mix it up a little bit and talk about specialization in logistics. And we might get a DHL every those type, you know, those types of questions where you've got a specialist supply logistics firm that can help you. The local distribution center down the road from me, about three or four miles away, um, we've got Primark. It's like a small city. It's managed in partnership between DHL and Primark. If you go about a mile and a half the other way, I live quite close to the A14, which is a major artery, obviously this part of, part of the country with access to ports and stuff. Um, we've got another, a, a number of other distribution companies that are there. And there's another company up the way, I can't remember the name of it, but they are a central distribution warehouse for many luxury shoe companies. So one minute their workers could be putting, I don't know, a, a pair of Jimmy Choo's into a box. And again, Jimmy Choo don't want to pay for a warehouse. So they pay them for a part of a warehouse and then staff fulfill the orders for them. OK, to different standards, depending on the provider. I don't care who puts the stuff in a bag as long as they get my Jimmy Choo's. Anyway, on to distribution methods, um, B2B. So if we're thinking about those business to business, we're talking about bulk purchase probably, um, and companies like Burberry, obviously they are a, lu a luxury fashion brand. And yes, they might have their own stores in certain luxury destinations. And if we're talking about should Burberry go into a new market, don't treat all markets as the same. Think about where the money is. OK, now Burberry are not everywhere in the UK, but you might find Burberry in lots of department stores if we had lots of department stores. And Harrods is an example. You can see here a little bit of a collab going on um, where Burberry have basically dressed up the doorman in Burberry outfits as well. So a lot more promo um, merchandising going on at Harrods, which is fine. Um, and it promotes the brand, it promotes Harrods, it went viral on social media, which helps Harrods and Burberry clearly. Um, and they want to be in that prime location. So when Harrods or Selfridges want to buy from Burberry, they will say, we want this much. Now, we also need to understand the importance of EPOS. So electronic point of sale. So it's the, the, the till system. When you walk in and you buy your I know, Burberry scarf, um, and you're in Harrods and you take it up to the counter and they put it through the till. As a consumer, you think they're just taking your money. No, 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 not at all. This is fully integrated into the supply chain. So the till software, the electronic point of sale, EPOS, will automatically update not only Harrods stock management system, but they will communicate to possibly Burberry head office. Now, Harrods will not want to buy thousands and thousands of Burberry scarves just in case they can't sell them. So they will agree with Burberry a minimum amount to keep in store. And then they will, using their sales forecasting um, skills and technology and experience, they will then forecast the sales for the year. They will agree with Burberry in advance on prices. If we hit this many scarves, this is the price we will get. However, if we get 75%, just to illustrate a point, the price might be different. Now, the benefit to Harrods is they don't have to have huge amounts of stock. They can get the stock very quickly because of modern logistics. This, this EPOS software will automatically order stock and it will arrive with probably within about 48 hours, uh, depending on the agreement they've got with Burberry or the company like DHL that manages Burberry Warehouse. Now, the disadvantage to this is what it does is it's really good for Harrods because they don't have to stock so much of the luxury products. And if they if the, suddenly the season changes or people don't want to buy Burberry scarves or something, then they're not stuck with loads of stock that they need to discount. What it does is it pushes the pressure down the supply chain, in this case to Burberry. 
And Burberry can probably cope with that. And also they're very good at forecasting and they've worked with Harrods for years. Now you imagine if you're a small fashion retailer, you just get that dream contract with Harrods. Harrods expect you to give them new stock, to replenish their stock within 48 hours. They might not pay you for that stock for three to six months. Um, and also you've got to get it made. So depending where you get it made depends on the lead time and everything else. So your sales forecasting as a new company, and this is the important thing with sales forecasting questions, you may have inaccurate data. You might overestimate because you're an entrepreneur and you are so you know, confident with your brand outselling the likes of Burberry. So you have to think about this. So those new business startups or relatively new businesses that are going through the growth cycle and the product life cycle, what they might experience is cash flow problems whilst they get these new contracts. And I've heard of companies that have pitched the big contracts and they're just too big and they decide to turn them down because they're just not ready for it. It's all of those upscaling problems of going from small to big or smaller to bigger, um, but also those cash flow problems. Okay, There's no point in getting these big contracts if you can't survive. These big contracts will also come with lower profit margins and maybe you choose to sell through other distribution channels which are higher profits. Okay, so that's quite important for you to take on board. So if we're thinking about B2C, then it could be that we've got the online retailers, the pure plays, that will have a warehouse somewhere, maybe run by them, maybe run by someone else, and you order on the website, it's automatically goes through the order goes through a warehouse, they stick it in a bag or a box and it comes to you. Uh, we're seeing a lot of this. Now, depending where the demand is in the country, for example, if we're looking at the UK, depends where they decide to put distribution centres. Um, closer to customers are the better, but then again, they're really expensive to build, to rent and to run. So you have to think about sometimes um, that you might be travelling, your parcels might be travelling from the other side of the country or even further, depending on how much demand there is. Think about this from a global perspective. If ASOS are going into a country that's on the other side of the globe, when they went into Australia, for example, they're going to have to invest or work in partnership to develop this logistics system. If they were opening up in a country next to where they already were, then maybe there's some shared best practice and resources, depending if they're in a trade block with free movement of goods, for example. So look out for these types of clues. Now, remember what we've said in a previous video is sometimes when we're talking about mergers and acquisitions, buying up your supply chain can create extra profit opportunities. So can B2C. If you buy directly from a company, then they're not paying someone else a profit margin. So this is quite important for you to take into account. However, there are some companies, like DHL for example, who are just very, very good at logistics. They might be able to do the logistics cheaper than you can do it. So it's not just about gobbling up the entire supply chain. It might be better that you don't do it. Okay. C to C, Depop, directly to consumers. And remember, if I wanted to set up a second-hand clothing company... I would need IT experts, I would need social media, I would need everything. It might just be me selling 20, 30 grand's worth of secondhand clothes a year. I may not want to do that. I may not have the, the know-how or expertise or time to do that. I might just be better, it might be better off spending my time going around, I don't know, thrift stores, secondhand shops and getting clothes. So we need to think about these things. This is, I thought initially, bunch of people selling old clothes which it is but there's also people that run their businesses from these platforms as well so we've, we've got the this type of home-based small businesses that could grow into something else and depop i mentioned amazon at the beginning of the um <laughs> excuse me of the video um depop are that third party or that will take a commission Okay, it's like Deliveroo. My local takeaway um, can't afford and doesn't understand how to get a, mass, a brilliant website to advertise their food. So they just shove their stuff on Deliveroo. 
um, Just Eat, those types of platforms, they are very good at social media, marketing and e-commerce. All you're doing is you're paying for the privilege. I think they pay about 25% commission on every single order. So social media, um, I won't go through this too much, um, but mainly because you're bombarded by it all the time. I'm presuming most of you will understand this. But but we are in an age of social media influencers. You know, I was going to put the Kardashians up. I, I spoke to my wife and thought, well, who do you um, follow? And I'm thinking, well, maybe the people that are watching this video uh, might be following other people. But then again, um, her second person was Kylie. Um, and she also mentioned a number of the Kardashians as well okay obviously you've got The Rock um, and lots of other ones in there as well but look look at how much their earnings are just from social media and that's in addition to their normal businesses if we think about the cosmetics range of, of Kylie if we talk about Kardashians um, you know we've just had the Super Bowl um, you know an amazing an amazing um, bit of advertising and just shows how big this brand has got. Okay, there are lots of other social media influences out there as well, sometimes from popular TV that then go on to do other things. So they're sort of famous for being famous. Um, and as long as they do well from it, then good luck from it. As long as they don't get harmed, as some of them have struggled. But if we think about social media influencers, um, yeah. I think I've already said that. So here's Molly May um, and lovely dog. Um, and now she's being paid probably quite a lot of money um, from pretty little things. And there's there's other things out there as well. So millions of people follow are following her on social media. Um, a very trendy brand at the moment, I'm told. And, you know, may as well take advantage of it. So, yes, there are also fads out there as well. So we'll mention the fad of renting clothes. Um, briefly mention this. I won't dwell on it too much. So you can see that you can have this Burberry handbag for £26 a day. I'm not sure how long you would have to have it for to get it for that. I'm sure it's not going to be too cheap. £48 a day for this Chanel one. Um, and you can, you know, if you're going skiing for a month, then uh, if you're lucky, then maybe you can just rent your new ski gear. Okay, and then give it back. Let's hope it's got no rips in it, scratches in it, because it'll be like renting a car. It goes back with a little blemish and they will bill you for the lot. So there's lots of these sorts of things that we're starting to see on the internet. And it might be that it's people that aspire to have these brands I think the, the USP that they're tending to look at the moment, I'm not sure if it comes up next, here we go, um, is to think about environmental. So the reason that these things have been reinvented yet again, I think before it was accessibility to luxury brands, and now it's going down the reuse, resell type of thing. Um, and maybe this is the counter argument to fast fashion. Well, fast fashion is use it, bin it. Um, because you can't really use it too much before it's all out of shape and, and discoloured. Maybe if you want that experience of something new, you pay a premium in the short term, enjoy it, give it back. We'll see what happens. OK, so here's our vintage, our pre-loved stuff. Um, we see these types of messages on website. It's basically secondhand. Um, and yeah, so vintage, secondhand clothing, Depop, mentioned it already. And uh, won't dwell on that too much. OK, sort of recycling. Yeah. So there's lots of adverts out there that are trying to persuade us to resell our stuff because all of those platforms that we can sell it through will obviously take a commission. Um, and why not? If someone wants to use something that you're not going to, maybe you've outgrown it, maybe you just got bored of it, then maybe someone else can enjoy it. Self-explanatory. Okay, a bit of Amazon, a bit of Facebook, Depop, Etsy. You can you can read, but there's obviously the big players in there. Now they they've also got we could we could do a Porter's Five Forces case study on this. 
Um, if you think about that power of the buyer, the power of the supplier. Um, if I was looking for secondhand clothes, maybe I would be loyal to Depop and not the resellers. So in some ways, if I've got my entire business on Depop, um, building long-term brand loyalty for my company is more difficult. But this might be an easy way. Barriers to entry, threats of new entrants. You could use these platforms to make it easier and more accessible. <coughs> Moving on. We have a bit of DHL for three slides. So I'm going to whiz through this. You can read the text. Um, but this is an ever-changing ever industry fashion. You know, we've got a global economy um, and you know it, it's it's got to be challenging for all companies to be able to cope with this. So ways of working with specialists to help you are very important. Um, DHL boasts that they can get anything from one side of the planet to the other side of the planet within 24 hours. Um, clearly, that's not using environmental forms of transport, um, but or environmentally friendly, but they can do it. Can Marks and Spencers boast the same thing? Well, clearly not. That's not what they want to do. So we're, th we're thinking about things like increasing demand for sustainability and transparency. OK, so you can go to them and just say, I need to be able to tell my customers how this has got here. The carbon footprint, the impact on the environment, those sorts of things are really important. Um, if we think about the innovation, well, if you're a transport company, a logistics company specialising in logistics, you're going to be constantly trying to improve logistics in a country, around the world, e-commerce systems, all those sorts of things. If I was a fashion brand, I'd be focusing on marketing, developing brands, relationships with customers. These guys can specialise in it. And when it was a chocolate theme a few years ago, and we had Calabao International come in as guest speakers, I met the team that designed the machine that put the chocolate on the inside of Cornetto's. Yes, my life is exciting. Now, Wall's Ice Cream, yeah, I know there's a brand, but that company, yes, they want chocolate on the inside of a cone, but do they really want to invest all that time, energy, R&D in designing a machine? Well, actually, Calabao basically work with technology and chocolates and supply chains of chocolate. They're the, one of the biggest purchasers of chocolate across the globe that most of you have never heard of that's because they're the specialists behind the brands sort of the same thing for companies like dhl okay now if you think about it you know they want to create and maintain efficient adaptable e-commerce systems adaptable adaptable to you adaptable to product life cycle I'm growing, I'm mature, it's going into a declining market. I want to go into a new country. Um, I, want, I want different languages. I need to understand the local laws. Maybe this sort of company can help you. And let's face it, costs a fortune to get a new customer. Loyal customers, less expensive to keep them loyal. Loyal customers buy more stuff from you more frequently, especially if they're happy with lo your logistics as well as the product. Here's some stats if we think about it. You know, this is a huge industry. This is interesting. 92% of shoppers prefer retailers offering easy returns. Offering them. They don't want hassle. Yeah, I tried to cancel my Amazon account the other day because um, I was bored of the TV and don't use it as much as I used to for the free delivery. Um, it was a nightmare. Absolute nightmare. I will remember that if I ever want to go back. OK, so you have to you have to think about this. If you want easy returns, there's a different business model for Amazon, obviously, with Amazon Prime. But if I want to buy my trousers from Marks and Spencers and they're the wrong size, I want it to be easy. I want to either pop into the store so I can try them on this time or I want to order another pair. I want to be able to send the other pair back easily. I want to be able to pop down to my local shop. Um, and drop in the parcel, which is why they take in lots of, you know, I've got the post office down the road, which you can do it through. If not, the corner shop that's open till about 11.30 in the evening will take them in. Okay. 
is very important. And think about the growing demand for online. If my online customer experience is not very good, then maybe customers are not going to come back to me. How many times have you found a parcel outside of your door, thrown over your hedge, um, or something like that? We're seeing a little bit less of that, and depending where you live depends if they would leave it outside your house. Um, but I've had parcels that have been left in the rain. I've had parcels that have you know, just been dumped over, over a fence because they're not paying their delivery drivers a lot. Um, and that's why I would choose not to use every. Okay, Just because they changed their name from Hermes doesn't make them any better. And then we've got premium experiences here as well. Um, you know, that could be the growth in next day, same day delivery. Um, and so there could be a premium service there. There could be some other things that we'll talk about in a bit. OK, so these are the three sections that we will talk through. I'll try and get through them quickly, but it's important that we do it. So just reminding you of some of those key stats at the top there. Keep those in mind when you're when you're thinking about this. So looking at this, these are some of the, the current trends that are out there. So production on demand, just in time. We'll do this in class. We'll spend some time on, on JIT. Uh, it's quite important. So we've talked about this briefly. We've talked about environmentally friendly stuff, automation. I mentioned the EPOS system in Harrods, automatic stop replenishment um, and negotiating and you know communicating with your supply chain. It can all be done automatically. And in warehouses, um, I, I toured the John Lewis warehouse a few years ago in Milton Keynes, and most of it is automated. Robots tend not to be in a trade union, get pregnant, phone in sick. Um, so actually, you can turn them on and off depending on demand. There are certain things that can be automatically packaged. These types of logistics companies invest in this technology. Fashion companies want to focus on fashion. OK, so there are benefits of econ economies of scale of automation here. You could have your stuff in a DHL warehouse and their technology can package it up more efficiently, probably than you can. Omnichannel sales markets. This is shops online, you know, B2C, B2B, depending on what your, your market is. Um, and we've got this is a growing trend in lots of retailers. I order online and then I choose where I'm going to pick it up from. So if I was to order something that wasn't in stock at Next and I said I wanted to pick it up from Next, it's probably a DHL warehouse that ships it directly to the Next store so I can pick it up. OK, so this is a growing trend when you've got these omni-channel um, or multi-channel retailers. Um, who's going to coordinate all of this? Well, it might be Next. They're big enough in the UK. We saw that from how much of their business is just in the UK. Um, however, smaller firms, OK, maybe. So some of the other stuff that's out there, uh, returns and collections. There are lots of companies that don't like online, but they've got to be in it. And I mentioned in a previous video how John Lewis got it wrong when they made it easy for me to take my TV back to Waitrose. Um, when I bought it from John Lewis, for example, that was a disaster. So very, very flexible for customers and not always good business. Now, these guys can help you with returns and collections so you don't have to worry about it. Yes, there's a cost involved, but they're also dealing with 50 other companies in the same warehouse, probably, unless you're a big company, of course. You've got a domestic, regional and international company that's already out there. When we talked in class about how Coca-Cola bought Costa Coffee and as a result, the company Costa grew by 60% in about 12 months. I think it was maybe 24 months. And that was because of existing supply chains in markets where Costa weren't already there or helping them grow rapidly across the United States because obviously Coca-Cola have already got the supply chain. <coughs> DHL are the same if they're helping you. So last mile specialist, we'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Um, but if you think about this in some of the more rural areas, you might need different types of logistics, depending what you're delivering, of course. So 
We've got different seasons. So you need to be working in your warehouse with keeping up with Black Friday sales and those sorts of things. And nearshoring or reshoring is really quite important because if there's more pressure to improve quality or workplace standards, for example, maybe you don't want the reputation um, that you might get from some of the cheaper production countries, then you might want to nearshore, which means, for example, Marks and Spencer's making stuff in Portugal and Spain instead of China. Reshoring would be bringing it back to the UK. OK, so nearshoring is an interesting term, <coughs> excuse me, that we've indirectly covered. Um, but uh, yeah, very interesting. You might be still going into a new country that you're not already there. OK, that's the point of working with a specialist logistics company. Now, we've also got this re-commerce and circular economy. We, talk, we talked about the circular economy, not the circular flow of income in a previous video. Um, and we're talking about how this is becoming more and more trendy, more and more mass market. So the niche small retailers that think this is an advantage, well, it was only an advantage for about five minutes until the big firms realized that they could um, build rapport with customers and monetize it. So they're going to need to do something a bit more, aren't they? Which is great because it's good for the environment. So the pre-loved fashion is something that the big retailers are getting into. How are they going to manage this? Yeah, well, this company's obviously thought that this is, a, this is an area that they can monetize and they're going to work with big retailers to help them. Okay, warehousing and distribution, I've mentioned, for example, Primark down the road, don't run their own warehouse. But they do have Primark managers that work in the warehouse that work with the DHL team. Luxury good logistics, um, normal stuff that's in there. Um, remember, we're looking at value added services. OK, and. The rest of it is relatively um, self-explanatory there, but this is. So the last mile service, this is the bit that I absolutely loved. Uh, for example, a white glove service. So you imagine you're this luxury brand and you know, whatever the brand is, choose something that's really expensive that a, a poor Dalmatian can't afford. And you expect premium service. So I order it online or, or maybe, um, you know, it, they didn't have it in, in stock in Harrods when I wanted to buy it. So they've ordered it in for me. And then there's a white glove service that comes to my door. They double check that it fits me. OK, maybe this is part of the service. Maybe I try it on. It could be immediate returns if it's unsuitable. No, I don't want that. Take it back. Thank you very much. It could be that they brought me four different sizes. I then try one, all of them on and I get the perfect party dress and the rest of them go back in pristine condition with the white glove service. Fantastic. I didn't even know that this existed, obviously. Um, I'm not the target group, clearly, but you imagine that DHL can manage this for you. You imagine that then the added value that this adds to your brand and it creates even more of a luxurious service. And here's the beauty. You don't have to manage it yourself. They're picking the dresses up from a central warehouse, which is storing up. 50 other luxury brands and me, the consumer, I don't know and I don't care and I just love the service. And I go back again and it differentiates it from another company. OK, sustainability, clearly a big thing here. And in this industry, security of high value items and anti-counterfeiting. As you're going into emerging markets, there might not be as good legislation. It can't, it, we've seen lots of counterfeiting go, going on in Asia, especially in the early days of Chinese manufacturing with the stories of Nike we've talked about in class. And actually, they can help you with this. The last thing you want is your luxury brand to be copied and then delivered because you're storing it in a third party warehouse. This company by the sounds of it, can help you. OK, um, yeah, 
flexible in demand. They can up, they can up it, they can down it. E-commerce support, same sort of thing. They can help you with all of this integration, which I mentioned earlier. Wow, that was a long one. Um, and we've literally only scratched the surface. Go onto the DHL website, read some of their research papers, go and have a look at some of your favorite brands, dig a bit deeper, find out, do they do their own logistics? Do they own their own warehouses or do they outsource it? Um, it won't take you long to find out these sorts of things. Be interested, think about the context and Think about those strap lines at the beginning of this presentation. There's a whole host of exam style questions there for you to consider as well. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, final thank you to um, Ian Marcuse for letting me share um, his notes and a lot of the last however many videos um, have come from Ian. Um, this one, for example, probably a couple of slides from Ian and the rest, obviously we've done some research but that was really, really useful. At Easter revision courses for um, with him um, and lots of other things. And, and a thank you to Tutor to You as well for their resources that we've bought in. Um, very reliable um, company and uh, they're doing some revision stuff in their cinemas soon. So uh, maybe you can find out when one is on when you're on school holidays. Hope you enjoyed that, everyone. Uh, see you in class. Goodbye. <laughs>